Um, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Accelerate ROI by using H2O.ai with Pega Customer Decision Hub. My name is Shabar Pula and I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.ai. I'd love to start off by introducing our speakers. David Perona, Head of Digital Transformation and Decision Management at H2O.ai. Um, Vince Jeff, Senior Director of Product Strategy for AI and Decisioning at Pegasystem. Before I hand it over to David and Vince, I'd like to go over the following housekeeping items. Please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar recording and slide deck will be available after the presentation is over. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to David. Great. Thanks a lot, Shabar, and it's great to be here today. Um, so before we get started, I thought since we might have a, an audience that doesn't quite know who H2O AI is, and maybe on the flip side there's people who don't know who know H2O but don't know PEGA, we figure we'd sort of give you a snapshot of each before we get started, and then we'll actually cover uh, what, what our agenda is for today. All right? So H2O is a leader in AI and uh, in, in open source AI and ML. Um, we've been around since 2012. Uh, we've got an entire AI platform. Uh, we're going to focus today not, not necessarily on open source but on driverless AI, uh, but just know that when we talk about uh, what we're talking about today is applicable as well to, to open source. Uh, we have a worldwide uh, reach globally. Um, we've got uh, within H2O over 220 uh, experts in data science. We, we're at 1,000 universities. We have over 20,000 companies who use our open source. And then we've got over 180,000 uh, Meetup members. So, of course, you can go to our website and learn more, but that's just sort of a, sort of a snapshot of who H2O is. Vince? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, welcome, everybody, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Vince Jeffs, uh, a Senior Director of Strategy with our uh, Customer Decision Hub offering at Pega Systems. And at Pega, if you're not familiar with Pega, uh, we are a CRM co company that revolutionizes the software that we like to think unifies both customer engagement and intelligent automation. And you can see that... Uh, you know, literally, we are serving millions of uh, automated processes to billions of customers every day, generating trillions of dollars of value. Uh, and we like to say if you've driven a car, used your credit card, et cetera, you've probably interacted uh, with PEGA. And uh, the next slide just shows kind of that uh, intersection of what we call CRM, customer engagement, which includes our customer decision hub, our customer service, and our sales automation, along with our PEGA platform, which is a case management, low-code app development environment, includes mobile, and has this intelligent automation that these two combined together help drive these outcomes uh, that I just mentioned. Yes, yeah, so what's really great now is that you can take um, a model artifact from H2O and deploy it and, and use it in, across, your, across your platform, for, uh, you know, across all of these interactions and, and decisions. So that's what we're really excited about today and what we're going to talk about. So our agenda. So we're going to talk generally about AI use cases because a lot of times when I talk to data scientists, it, it's always, well, what, what use cases should I start in? Which ones are the highest value? So we'll, we'll start sort of talking about that. We'll actually do a demo of driverless AI building a telco model, and we'll actually deploy that into PEGA. And then we'll, we'll cover, uh, I'll hand it over to Vince, and we'll, we'll talk about PEGA, and then we'll talk about how we work together, right, a joint value proposition. Does that sound good? Sounds awesome. Great. So the first thing, when, I, when I'm talking to, to, to groups of data scientists, and, and even on the business side, they often ask, "Gee, what use cases should we focus on?" And I, a lot of times, I'll just t uh, I'll just turn them on to this this uh, report that McKinsey did, which they, they they looked at more than 400 AI use cases across 19 industries and nine business functions, and figure out what is the highest impact or potential impact of AI across those areas. And so, and if you look to the right, you know this is kind of just generally saying, "Hey, it is really." marketing and sales and supply chain and manufacturing are the big areas. 
but you're able to drill down in their reports by industry. So you can pick your own industry and say, what are the, are the great use cases there for me? I'm in CPG or I'm in manufacturing or I'm in retail or I'm in telco. You can, you can find out what the mix is in your particular area. But in this, it's really sales and marketing or supply chain. Um, and, and in that, if you sort of drill into sales and marketing, it really is where McKinsey says is where you can create the most incremental value. So even if you have existing maybe traditional models that you've built, maybe using um, some legacy AI vendors or something that you've done, done you know, five years ago, even just uh, – Updating the, the algorithms to today and rebuilding those under a modern platform, you can get a really good business benefit, and that's also called on the McKinsey Report. But if we look at sales and marketing, the, the high-value use cases, which are um, generally as a customer service, next best product, next best offer, you know, how do you price and, or promote? Uh, how, how do you acquire customers? How do you reduce customer churn? How do you figure out what's the best channel to interact with a customer on? Across all these areas, that's, that's pretty much applicable uh, to what we're looking at today. Vince, do you want to make a comment on that? No, I think that uh, that spells it out pretty well. And I think the, uh, you know, the beauty of our joint proposition and offering here is that we're really going to be able to activate these analytics uh, in real time so that you can use it in these use cases and generate huge value and relevance in your communications. Right. So if we look across those areas and sort of put it back into our parlance or, or, or our language and not necessarily taking what, what, what McKinsey has, if we look across AI and sales and marketing, right, it's about increasing sales, loyalty, maybe next best customer, next best action, and customer engagement. And that's sort of all of, I look across all that, and it's pretty much, you know, as you interact with the customer. So increasing sales, you can think about as upsell and cross-sell, maybe promotions for the month. Uh, loyalty, you can think of, you know, personalization, maybe customer retention, addressing churn. Next best customer could be who do I want to send this promotion to or how do I want to take an action with this customer. And then on the engagement side, you can think of maybe advertising and ad placements or even product and content recommendations. Before we get, actually get into um, you know, more depth, I think it's, it's good to sort of talk about sort of our philosophy of how to best use AI and how to, how to build models that we use to drive customer engagement. Um, this slide kind of shows, you know, on one axis you see the, the operational effort of how much effort it takes, let's just say, to de deploy a model or deploy AI. And, and across the bottom, it's, it's business value. So what this is really saying is that it's easy enough, right, to potentially build a model in batch, let's just say a churn model that predicts yes or no, is this customer going to cancel his service? Um, and you could create that model and, and apply it to your customer database, do it in batch, do it every day, every week, every month, and let the business figure out how to use those scores, right, and, and, and figure out how they could best use them to address, you know, churn. And, and you'll definitely get value from that. Um, but I, I think it's really – but there's a lot of effort there, too. You have to go across your entire customer database and score them frequently, Right, because if you don't score them frequently, of course, it's going to get stale and may not be applicable or or as effective as they could be. Next, we think about so so to do maybe a little bit better than just batch is really invoking models in real time. Right, so you think about hey, when I need a model or I need a score, um, let's call it when I need it. So when I'm talking to this customer or I'm interacting with them in a mobile app, let's call the model in real time because it'll have the most recent data. It's only the models I need. Right, and get the scores and act on that. And that provides even more value than batch because you've got you know, all the recent data that helps drive what's the best decision. But ultimately, where you want to get when you're building models is that you want them to be really con what I would call contextually aware. So that really means what is the customer doing right now or in this session, right? What content has he viewed? Maybe he walked into, the, into a retail store and he wants to return an item or maybe he's calling to complain, or maybe we know he's actually in the store and we know his exact location, or we know what channel he's on. All those things that happen, you really want to take those into account when you say, what should I do with the customer? How do I best save them? So think of it as, 
how can I best save this customer given all the things he's just done and said, and what can I actually do to address it, right? So look at everything and put that in context and then get the models to make the, the, the prediction or score. And that's when you get the most value. The thing is, though, of course, it takes a little bit more effort, operational effort, right? And as you, as you integrate or embed yourselves in, or embed the models in these scores, and app, uh, these scores into applications, you need to sort of think about that. But in the end, when you do that, you get a lot more value. So we want to look at being con more contextually aware of uh, models used. As far as the overall, uh, what we're talking about today, the overall sort of data science workflow, if you will, I'm not going to go over this too much. But we start from the left-hand side. Uh, we're going to sort of you know, get data, build a model, explain a model, deploy a model, monitor it in production, and then deploy it into PEGA. Now, from the H2O perspective, we're just going to focus on using driverless AI today and looking at quickly build a churn model and deploy it to PEGA. Uh, just be aware that, of course, we've got the, the full sort of data science life cycle to support uh, to support it all, but we're really just focusing on that one piece. So we're going to build a model and then deploy it in the PEGA. Anything else? Vince, want to make a comment on this? Uh, well, I'll just say that on your previous slide, um, yep. uh, the, the sort of the maturity model, which I, uh, I really like that view because it does really reflect that, which is in order to be a little bit more um, effective, you've got to put a little bit more effort into it, but there's payoff associated with that effort. And when we really think about what David is, is you know, saying here, it's, it, it really is all about you know, taking the data, gleaning the insights out of that that are going to give you, the model is going to help under, understand the behavior of the customer, the intent of the customer, the sediment of the customer. And if that's stale, if that's old, if that's batch, then it's probably not going to reflect their current situation. And so our whole effort here, the reason why we want to be able to do this faster, which equals better, is because we're going to then be more accurate with understanding and knowing that customer, and then we're going to be able to treat them more effectively. That's great. Totally agree. Okay, so next we're actually going to get into the, uh, the demo itself, and we're going to, again, build a, a telco churn model and then show how we deploy it into PEGA. So what we have is a, is a simple data set that we have at sort of at a customer account level, and we've got a column in there that says whether or not this customer uh, canceled or churned this month. Okay. So this is a, just a simple uh, screenshot just showing what that data set looks like. As you can see on the left-hand side, how long has the customer had the account in, in weeks, what their phone number is, what their plan is, how many minutes they use, what the, whether, or not they ha have a, um, whether or not they use their voicemail, may they, may they have international calls, do they call into customer service. At the very end, we've got a column that says, did they churn, yes or no. So we're going to take that um, data set and bring it into driverless AI and to quickly build a model that predicts whether or not the customer is going to churn. And so what you see here on this screen is driverless AI, and what we're doing is just defining an experiment. That's where we you know, bring data in and build a model. And what you'll see on the left-hand side is sort of the notes of, of, of what's been configured. Um, what I've done here is created uh, just a simple telco churn experiment. I've split our data set that you saw previously uh, into a training, both a training data set and a validation data set. Um, I've identified the column or what we're going to predict. We're predicting churn. And we're configuring what's important in the model. The, the level of accuracy, is that important? Is it the time that it takes to build the model? Is it how interpretable is the model? How can we easily understand it or explain it to a business person? And then also, you know, what sort of score function are, are we going to use? And so um, the intent of today is not to get really into the weeds on the modeling part of it, but, but just to say that you know, we've got some uh, um, settings that you, you can use. You could also use advanced settings to say how we're going to build the model. Um, but you can kind of see that you're able to configure you know, what, what the, this experiment is going to do and then launch it to actually build the model. And this is what the screen looks like once the model has been built. 
I think the really interesting part, there's a few, obviously, a lot of interesting things here. Uh, we see our experiments in the upper left that we actually ran it, what, um, how many records we had in it, how, how many unique uh, um, columns or how many unique responses do we have. You know, we have true and false of the customer churn. We see on the left, the bottom left, the winning model, which is an XG boost model and it, its effectiveness. We've got our variables and, and their importance. So what we've done is automatically done uh, feature engineering on that data to create new potential features through uh, transforming the data. And then based upon that and based upon the variable importance, you can kind of see what, what goes into the model. On the, on the very right, we've got like a summary of the, uh, of the, of the experiments. And one of the things we haven't talked about yet, which is called a mojo, it's a model object that um, actually is the artifact that can be generated from us building a model. And what we, what's interesting here is that we, we can actually execute this model very quickly, and it, and it only takes um, only a, a, few mil, a few milliseconds to actually execute, them, execute this. So it's, it's actually the mojo latency, so once we put it in production, is a really fast model, right, so when we execute it. If we look in the middle where we have sort of the status of the model build, it's, it's complete, right, but we can do lots of other things with it, right? We can actually try to interpret the model, which is sort of build a model that explains the model, uh, we've got, do you want to you want to transform it on another data set? Do you want to uh, download this to score uh, in, in Python? Do you want to visualize it? Do you want to generate an auto report? There's a lot of different things you can do. What we're, what we're going to look at uh, in the next few slides is going to be the interpretability of it and then downloading the Mojo, if you will, the Mojo scoring pipeline to be executed within Pega. So, Keep in mind, the mojo, what it really is, is once we've built the model and we're happy with it, we want to take it into production, and that means deploy it in the PEGA platform. As far as interpretability, we can, uh, there's a lot of you know, reports and visualizations that come out of interpretability, but one way or one visualization that comes out of it is very simple segmentation of the model, of the results. And so if we look at sort of this decision tree, we can see that if we use whether or not someone had a, a, a day charge, we use, a, we use a voicemail plan if they lived in certain states, that um, we could predict churn at 84%. But we can also look at other sort of areas or other sort of segments and see, well, gee, I can see over here that there's a churn rate, a lower churn rate of 0.27%, right? So that's... So that at least gives us an idea to explain it to business folks or even for yourself to understand what's going on with the model. How can it really, is it really doing a good job? How can I understand how it's predicting? Well, that's a good way to describe it. Um, another one is just uh, another report, uh, Interpretable Model Explanation Plot, which is just plots all of, the, um, all of the rows in the data set, and you're able to look at it and see if the prediction was right or wrong, a, a, a false positive uh, or a, a true positive. And, um, and you can kind of look at wh why it was predicted. The other part of interpretability is automatically documenting your model. So you're ready to put it in production, right, in PEGA, but you probably want to at least document it so everyone else who looks at it can understand it, or, or if the business wants to use it, this can, uh, then this is, it gives you documentation that you could share with the business that describes the whole process. So this is the auto doc, if you will. I'm not going to go through all of it but, it, but it documents how we built the model, what the um, what features actually ended up in the model? What algorithm is in there? How how long did it take? What some of the settings? Whether or not we saw um, you know what we used for tuning, etc. And describes the variables and transformers that are used. And so all this is automatically documented. So you can of course um, um, if you want to archive it to come back to it later or as part of your, your, your typical process of deploying models in production, you can then have the auto docs and, and use it and, and refine it as you wish. But the more exciting part is that, in my opinion, I mean, everyone loves documentation, I know, but a really exciting part, though, is actually deploying the model in production. So if you hit the button that says download the Mojo pipeline, what you'll download is, as you can kind of see on the screen, some of these assets here. So you've seen, you can see there's a pipeline.mojo, and you can see some runtime, and you can see some actually graphs. Since we're using XGBoost model, there's actually, I can't 
display it on, on the screen here because it's too large, but it actually shows you graphically the data that's going into the model and the predictions that the model is making. So that's what you see here about XGBoost. And you see the, the source data coming in, you see so, some transformations and feature transformations, and then it goes into XGBoost that then executes it and, and actually writes an output whether or not someone is uh, going to churn. And you can see all, all the assets out there too, so you can click on that and see it. But the more important thing is now we've got a pipeline mojo that we can bring into, um, into Pega. So, what you can, uh, Vince? Did you want to do this one, or do you want me to walk through this? Sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah, thanks, David. I can walk through yep. this. So, you know, I love this the 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 power of the H two O AI platform that we just saw, and the beauty of what we're going to show you how it works now is that I take that and I love that name Mojo. You guys come up with cool names for uh, for output files, so I love it. Um, we're going to take that um, file, and what you're looking at in the upper left-hand screen there is a screenshot of Pega, what we call Prediction Studio. And in Prediction Studio is kind of what we think of as our, our operational environment for models. Those models can come from a variety of places, including H2O AI. And all I have to do is simply hit a button to say I want to import something and in this case I just say I want to import a mojo file and then the second screen you see right below it is just a couple of you know configuration settings that I'm going to set before I import this file so first of all I'm going to make sure I know that um, whether I'm predicting the probability of a true or false in this case I want a true to be yes they churned um, then I also want to classify the model in pega terms so we know it's an XG boost model but we keep sort of a taxonomy of models, and we do that because we want to keep track of sort of what models are a little bit more maybe opaque than others, just for the purposes of when we then deploy them. We can put some regulations around the approvals that are necessary and this sort of thing. Uh, then also, you see, we want to understand what the expected performance is. So David said that in the H2O platform, it's showing a, you know, a, a performance of around 84%. So we might put in what we think is a threshold of performance that we would expect this model once we operationalize it to be returning so that we can you know we can look at it and we can have the system sort of automatically flag if there's something unusual in the performance that we're actually seeing uh, and then really lastly it's just the you know the range of values that we would expect to see in this case it's we're doing a binary classification so it's a ba essentially a, a zero or one and once we've either taken defaults or picked a few of these items, then the only other thing we've got to do is just map to the PEGA customer profile. And actually, most of that would not be necessary if we were simply outputting data from first-party data from PEGA, feeding it over to H2O, so H2O uh, would build the model, and then when it comes back in, we pretty much automatically map in that step to the fields that we had essentially exported. And then lo and behold, it shows up, you see in the upper right, as a operational model ready to go to be deployed in Pega strategies or in what we call our next best action designer environment. Great. That looks great. Um, so just quickly on the mojos again, is, is that really it is, so we have a lot of ways to deploy our models, but one of them is a mojo, and that's able to uh, be deployed in a lot of different environments, and as we saw, it's really out of the box to deploy to uh, Pega CDH. Um, but there's other environments that can be deployed to as well, right, to uh, you know, a RESTful web service, we can deploy it out to um, AWS, we could deploy an environment for Java or Python or R, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways to deploy the Mojo, but but this is really, uh, I think, a really slick and simple way to do it, and then bring it right, bring that model right into the customer interaction, and and really get into the whole real time scoring and and, and decisioning. It's just a really slick way to do it. Okay, I think that's our that's the end of our uh, sort of our demo, and now we're going to cover the Pega side. Vince. Yeah, thanks, David. So um, we kind of launched right into uh, this, and this is great because I think this audience wants to see kind of how it works and you know what the nuts and bolts of this are. But I thought I would just take a step back and make sure everybody is aware of 
kind of what PEGA is doing in this respect and why PEGA is even needed. And really it comes down to at the very conceptual level, the fact that if you're doing what we would call a next best experience or a next best action kind of approach, what you're doing is you're really balancing um, the customer's needs, which is the customer, if it's a consumer, they expect you as a brand to be relevant, contextual, like what David said about having that, you know, more advanced contextual capability. They, they expect you to time things reasonably well, and they also expect you to be convenient and consistent and this sort of thing. At the same time, you as a brand that are trying to treat that consumer have certain things that you have to sort of, you know, cover yourselves. You've got, you've got the need to market and sell. You've got existing customers that need service and need to have those service outcomes, you know, uh, delivered in a in a timely and a in a seamless fashion. You sometimes have this problem of churn, and so you're more worried about just retaining this relationship than growing it. Um, also, at times, customers get into problems, right? They they have risky profiles. They have bad credit scores. They go into collections. And so you have to be cognizant of all these things. And the basis of what PEGA does, and we'll show it in a second, is that we balance these things on a customer-by-customer -customer basis, not for a segment, not for some huge wide audience, but on a customer-for-customer -customer basis. So if you go to the next slide, it just kind of um, lays out um, and these are just the channels that are building out here. So we do that across all paid and owned channels uh, that a brand might use to engage with their customers. But under the covers, what's going on is there are a set of strategies for these different business concerns. And this is a trivial example of only showing four strategies, but it gets the point across, which is these are very different things that you're doing, sales and marketing. There's all kinds of different offers and treatments you can do there, but there's these other things that may or may not take precedence depending on the journey that the customer's on and the stage that they're in in that journey. And what we do is we arbitrate all those strategies together. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, give us the next best set of offers. Give us the next best set of service actions. Give us the next best mitigation strategy. Give us the, um, you know, the, the best retention strategy. And now what we're going to do is in real time, we're going to decide what is the moment that we need to meet for this customer. And that's what we call this next best action arbitration that you see sort of over there on the right. And if you go to the next slide, it really depicts the anatomy of that. What's going on? Well, what's going on is the, the business is, is having to program in their policies and all the actions that are possible and the KPIs they want to achieve. At the same time, we talked about that data that's constantly where we want the most up-to-date data. So we're accessing the latest we have historically about the customer, but we're also streaming data in and we're taking that into consideration at this sub-second moment that we're making a decision for this customer. And we're doing that in that very middle where we're arbitrating with this basic formula and using all the propensities that, ha that we're getting from models such as what H2O AI gives to then make this next best action decision and have a set of results that we can feed to the channel. So again, all this is happening at scale, thousands of interactions per second at huge brands that we're doing this with all each time that we're called and we have to return this next best action set of recommendations in less than 200 milliseconds. So that's the, that's kind of the, if you lift the cover of the engine and you look under, that's, that's what you'll see. But if you now open it up and say, okay, well, do, how does PEGA fit into a broader ecosystem? If you go to the next slide, we'll see that. So you'll see that same engine sort of in the middle. It's called CDH production and it runs on, you know, various clouds. We have AWS and we can do it on other clouds and so forth. But you can see over there on the, on the lower right, this is where we're getting in the uh, the mojo. So we're bringing it into Prediction Studio. We're then putting it into a strategy. That strategy is getting um, deployed into a production environment. And once it's in that production environment, then we're using the data and we're using those uh, scores to make these decisions and to return them to these various channels that you see. And you can see that you know, we're an open ecosystem working with a number of modeling capabilities, but the reason why we chose this 
you know, this part, or we decided to, you know, to partner with H2O is because the way they do this is totally unique. It scales at, you know, these volumes that I mentioned, literally uh, thousands of decisions a second. And they can only, we can only do this because of this mojo capability where we get this actual representation of the model and we have a runtime environment of H2O inside of our production system so that when we call it, we know it's going to return a model score to us you know, in under 50 milliseconds. And uh, in fact, even faster than that. So that's the beauty of this this partnership and this this technical uh, coupling that we've got. Yeah. So, so you know, for, for me as a data scientist, right? So, I, so I could be building models in a lot of different environments, and even you know, dropping in models for fraud or credit risk or churn. I mean, I, I you know, I, I can create those models and then deploy them into Pega, where you're, you're right. There's really low latency because we're being run with the near engine. It's not necessarily needs to call out to other clouds or other systems where, you know, if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about millions of uh, interactions a day, then, you know, you really don't want those, that dependency. But I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to look at things where you can sort of take your models that maybe you built in other environments, you know, on fraud and credit risk, and actually drop them into the interaction and be able to, you know, react to that or at least dr help drive or, or help you decide what is the best strategy to take. Yeah, and um, you know, it, it, you may see it here on the lower left. Also, next to uh, H2O is you know an open AI capability that we have with Google and Amazon. However, I will say that we have a lot less uptake and traction with that because of this very fact that in order to to use those platforms, I've got to call out a service to go get a model in real time. And to do that with network latency and with any latency that might exist on those platforms, even though these are very strong players and clearly they have lots of computing power, we still have noticed that we don't get the performance that we need because all told, we have to do all of the work that you saw in that decision layer. Um, and so we're not just we're not just serving up, a, you know, just ranking a model score and then serving something up. We're going through a complex set of, you know, contact policy rules and volume constraints and all these things to make sure that you're hitting the customer, you know, with things that matter to them, that are applicable to them, suitable for them, all those things. We have to go through all those rules. We have to get that model score for, you know, the churn model or the propensity to buy or respond model, and then we have to return that all in literally, you know, under 100 milliseconds. So the modeling piece just can't take too long is the, is the bottom line. Great. So the last thing we're going to talk about is sort of our joint value proposition and, and how to get started. So, so from, from an H2O's perspective, um, you know, a, as we look at these sales and marketing use cases, I mean, we've got uh, just some dramatic uptake in effectiveness when we're bringing models in, in the real time. So, you know, in, in digital marketing context, we, we, we've helped improve uh, marketing campaigns by a really a lot, right? Uh, addressing customer churn, uh, you know, getting a 25% increase in that is, is not unusual for us. Um, even increasing sales through, through personalization that's driven from models does a great job. Um, and the other side of it, too, is that just trying to build models faster in our platform, you know, build them fast and deploy them fast, we often can just, you know, crank out your modeling factory, in, you know, increase it, increase your capacity, even, even double it, right? And so those are sorts of the use cases or, or I say the, the business results that we've gotten, right, in, 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 in real customers and even, even along the lines of, you know, what, what's an effective discount? If I do something on promo, should it be 8% off? Should it be 10% off? Should it be 1% off? What's the impact to, uh, to, the, to the business if we do that? What's the impact on the customer, et cetera? And, and just doing things like that, you know, across all these business cases that, that using uh, AutoML has really done a phenomenal job at that. Yeah, and I'll cover this. So this is, um, you know, sort of echoing or, or just, you know, launching off of data, uh, David's comments and his successes. We're seeing successes along the same line. So we really think that the combination of these two will equal, equal even better um, performance. So 
at at banks we've seen you know in, increases in response rates of six six times on the things that they were doing in batch mode or you know sort of segment based we've seen nps scores I increase for these brands because why because their customers are being met with things that are more appropriate, suitable, relevant, timely, uh, and they're not being spammed with things that, you know, or being aggravated or annoyed by, you know, marketing and messages that aren't applicable. Um, and of, of course, we're, we're also, the beauty of AI is it's not just a question of doing things automatically in channels like web or mobile, but it's also assisting human beings with the service that they're providing or the marketing and selling that they're doing on behalf of the brand to customers. So that may be in an agent assisted channel where you've got people that are responsible for having conversations with customers to make sure they've got the right service, to make sure that, you know, the discounts they're receiving are, you know, appropriate to their, you know, to their uh, type of value. Um, and that, um, that they're getting their questions answered, quite frankly, in a fish, efficient and effective way if it's through a customer support channel. And modeling can help with all those things because you've got to be able to do things like predict. Is a customer likely to call? If they are likely to call because there's a problem, why not proactively do something about it ahead of time? You might actually solve the problem and prevent the call, which is expensive for brands for coming in in the first place. So we see tons of applications of this, definitely in sales and marketing, as David pointed out, but even going beyond that to really serving the entire customer journey from the time that they're becoming aware of your products to the time that, you know, they're sort of raving fans. Yeah, so so I, I think, you know, with us together, I mean, if you're if you're on here, you know, as a data scientist, right, you might be building your models you know, on a data platform somewhere that has all your, your your history from the beginning of time, right, or all the transactional data or all the uh, digital data that you have on, on your customers in, a, in a, the data platform, and you can build your model based upon that and then ultimately have that be delivered and utilized w within all your customer interactions, right, if you, if you deploy that into PEGA. It's a, really, it's a really slick and easy way to get your models into production because, at the end of the day, right, it is about getting the value out of your models being in production. And once you do that, that that's when you actually realize the, 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 uh, the business value. Yeah, and if I might just add one thing, David, since we're, um, we're, we were staring at that screen with the second logo that had Commonwealth Bank of Australia on it, that is a joint oh, customer right. of ours. So that's one of yep. our – oh, no, thanks. Um, that's one of a, you know, our showcase customers for the value and the way they approach – they call it Next Best Conversations, but they are a big H2O um, AI shop and, and fan, I know. Uh, and they are doing a, a fabulous job with what I would call model ops. So this whole idea of how do we most effectively analytically transform what we're doing, not just build models and deploy models, but how do we as an organization, you know, make the most of our data and analytics to activate it in this, you know, in this this the strategic environment that is pega and so you can see down there on the close to the bottom of you know one of the things they're doing they're they're literally being able to treat this like a factory of models that that are moved into production and that they can maintain and monitor and refresh and the you know the fact that they're using pega and h2o effectively together is enabling them to do this I mean that that's a great story too. I mean I did see the you know you know we, we do have experience at Commonwealth Bank, but but to hear their overall uh, use case and, and and their 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 um, their customer uh, success is just it's phenomenal. If you have a chance to ever see the the your your, your video on that is just phenomenal on the volumes that they're doing at Commonwealth Bank. So getting started. So how do you get started? Well, I think the, the, the one of the easier things to do, right, is, is to actually um, either contact your H2O rep, right, or contact your PEGA rep, and they will uh, help to get started. I don't know if you had any other, other advice on that, but um, Vince, but of course, you know, focusing on the customer interaction 
and building models that can be leveraged by Pega, right, is really sort of what how you'd want to get started. You don't have to boil the ocean and make models on everything, but I think looking at areas like fraud or risk or churn are sort of really good areas to start in. Vince, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, if you can't, if you're struggling at all to figure out who, you know, to contact at PEGA, uh, you can feel free to contact me. My email address is vincent.jeffs at pega.com. Um, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm just vjeffs on LinkedIn. So feel free to shoot me a message or an invite, uh, and uh, I'll make sure you get connected with the right person at PEGA. Sweet. And you can contact me as well. I mean, I think our contact information is on that uh, on the first slide. Um, so at the end now, we have, uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience today. Shabar, do we have any questions today or not? Or have we answered everything Thank under you. the sun? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David and Vince. Um, we do have some great questions in the chat window, and we'll try to get to all of them with time permitting. Um, first question, what new use cases do you support with both solutions? I think I'll let Vince answer that one. Sure, sure. So um, – I think uh you know the the main use cases that we're supporting with this solution are uh you know some of the things that David pointed out like the ability to understand attrition risk of customers that's a great one that pretty much applies to all brands a lot of people think a churn is a telco problem but I would argue that every brand wants to do their best to retain existing relationships with customers and being able to have your finger on the pulse of the customer and have some kind of a measure of what their temperature is is really important to how you're going to treat them so that definitely that's that's not a new use case but it's a really important one outside of telecommunications that i think a lot of people um, you know, maybe aren't paying enough attention to. The other one that I'll mention, which is really important, is being able to understand the value of, uh, you know, a customer. And so then how you would treat that customer. So you can definitely use H2O to model things like, you know, customer lifetime value or just value associated with customer and bin them, come up with, you know, like deciles or, you know, if your firm doesn't already have some kind of strategic segments associated with the value, why do you want to do that? Well, that's going to help you a lot with how, again, you would treat those customers in certain conditions and situations. Um, clearly, we want to try to provide the best customer experience to every customer, but every customer experience is not equal, So, and every customer is not equal. So we need to do that balancing that I was talking about, and one of the best ways to balance is to really understand the value of the customer today, the value of them uh tomorrow and into the future. And most people model value somewhere in the range of at least a couple of years into the future so that yeah. you have some good sense for, you know, uh, you know what, what this, how this relationship might grow. I think that's a good point. It, it's really you start to think about, you know, what, are the, what is the impact over time, right, and trying to figure out what, you know, so, you know maybe I can figure out what, what the customer is going to do right now, but is that – and sort of address that, but also what is that impact going to be in one or two years? Is it, you know, maybe I, I undersold something or I gave them or I sold something that maybe over time isn't that great. Um, but, yeah, l looking at customer behavior over time, I think, is, is a great place to start. All right, next. Shabar. All right, great. Um, what does Pega Platform require to run H2O Mojo? Uh, it sounds like a Vince question. So, yeah, I think um, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, at Pega, we have when you um, when you uh, sign up with uh, with Pega, uh, you're going to be you're going to get the Pega platform. Um, you do need to have what we call the Pega Customer Decision Hub. So you could have just the Pega platform and not have the Customer Decision Hub. So to use the H2O uh, integration that we've seen with the Mojo capability, you do need to have the Pega Customer Decision Hub also. I think it has to be version 8.4, if I remember right, as well. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Perfect. And that is okay. our most recent release. Great. 
Next. Um, can't I just deploy my models without Pega? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, it, 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 so the question gets to be, you know, is, is you know, uh, operationalizing your models is, is, you know, is a significant effort. And so you, but you can, right? You can deploy it out to various environments and maybe stick a, a RESTful web service in front of it and then have, you know, have uh, some other systems call that web service. And that's all well and good. Um, but, I, I, but I think if you do have PEGA CDH, right, it, it's just a very nice way of not having to worry about you as a, maybe a data scientist, having to worry about the infrastructure side of it, right? So once you create that mojo, you push it over to PEGA, and, and you're essentially done. If it's, on your, if it's without PEGA, you, you have to have a, you know, a landing place for your mojo, and you may, maybe if it's already there, it might be fine, right? If, you already, if you've already deployed 100 models, then, then maybe that's an okay way to go. Um, but, I, but I think not having to worry about the infrastructure side of it and then having the context of the interaction that's available in PEGA and having it be right there, I think is really you know, the, the, you know, two really good reasons to do it. You don't have to do it, you're not required to do it, but I think it's really kind of a nice streamlined process to say, hey, if your company has already deployed PEGA CDH in certain channels, it's like, well, maybe that that's, that's, could be the, the, the better way to go if you want to go live on those channels or in those interactions. But really, you know, mileage may vary, of course, but, uh, but that, that, that's how I would look at it. Okay. Yeah, if I might just add um, one quick thought, okay. um, j j just real, I'll be real brief. Um, you know, at PEGA, we do focus on the enterprise uh, market. And so by that, we mean, you know, pretty large companies with pretty complex processes and pretty complex goals and co customer sets. And so um, I would argue that if, if you're trying to do this on your own, you're trying to what I would call build your own brain, because this brain is more than just the models and the propensity scores. It also is all these other things that, that I mentioned, like the engagement policies, the arbitration you have to do, all the channels you have to connect to, the content that you have to you know, merge in with that to get the next best treatment, the interaction history you have to store so that you've got great data for features that will then go back over to an H2O to model, you know, to get in that model loop. So all that is like what I call the full digital platform that you need. If you're a small brand, you probably don't need all that. Perfect. Okay. Um, does H2O and PEGA support PMML, PFA, or ONNX? Uh, I can field that one. So at PEGA, we do support importing PMML. We have for years. That's predictive uh, modeling markup language. It's a, sort of an XML-based you know, expression of a model. Um, it's got its own sort of you know, drawbacks. It's kind of you know, an old style way of doing it. It's just going to bring it. It's going to bring in just a representation of that model, but it's not going to have this runtime environment that H2O has. Um, it also is going to be limited in um, what kinds of models you can bring in. So the mojo, the beauty of it is, it can be, bring virtually any model into the Pega environment. And David showed XG Boost, but the sky's the limit on the kind of models that can come in through H2O. Um, David can speak more to that, but the, that's you know the the difference as far as uh, onyx i don't remember what the other two were but i think onyx was one of them um that we've followed that and we have not found that that has a huge traction for deep learning yet so we're keeping an eye on it but we felt like it was better to 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 you know to invest in h2o because h2o can bring in can bring a deep learning model in um and we can bring that in through a through a mojo Okay, next question. Okay. Um, I have a two-part question. The first part uh -oh. is, to what, <laughs> to what mm -hmm. degree do any of your customers require significant digital transformation before they are able to benefit from PIG and H2O? I'll take a quick stab at that. I would say that um, digital transformation is a journey. It's not something that you're going to accomplish. First of all, we all know that the, the approach to like CRM from 15 or 20 years ago where people tried to code away for 18 months and then launch it doesn't work. 
I think that's all been proven. The, the data warehouse error proved that as a bad strategy. So this whole approach that we've all taken now to Agile is, is the approach that you should take to digital transformation. And what I mean by that is you can get started with H2O and PEGA in literally 90 days. And we do what we would call a first you know, M MLP. We like to call it minimum lovable sort of product uh, for production. Um, but the point is, is that we are tuned to being able to roll out and get value fast. But that is a progression. So each one of those then MLPs that you these micro journeys that you'll go on will build your in, you know upon the next one and will provide you with this eventual digital transformation. Yeah, and I would just say that yeah, you, you, it's as you know obviously you have to take small bites and do it incrementally. Um, but I, I do think if if you even go back and look at the McKinsey report on AI and look at some of the higher value use cases there, right? If you're just starting, that that's not a bad place to look at either. And 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 just just take baby steps, right? Just, you don't need to build, you know, you don't need to build everything all at once. And and you can try to to, to use, uh, you know, maybe so, some initial models, maybe on, on on customer engagement, and try to do some personalization that way. Right, you don't need to do everything all at once. Okay, and the second part of that question is, what's the longest an implementation has taken, and what were the factors leading to the duration? Well, so I, I can answer that from a. Oh, well, go ahead, David. Sorry, I was going to start on on, on on the modeling side. I mean, for H two O, in the end, I mean, it just depends. You know what the organization want. You know uh, what the strategy is. Are there other initiatives going on, right? As far as digital transformation or others, um, and so that's really what 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 the answer gets to be. Um, the longest. I mean, we've we've got. Pro I mean, typically, right? We we go, we go and find figure out where your operational platform is and where your sort of your data platform is and build models and work on those being deployed. But that that's typically. You know that's typically sort of a weeks or months sort of uh, um, engagement. It's not. It's definitely not years. But of course, it depends. Our other dependencies on other platforms, other projects. But from a, from a, an H two O building models based upon you know high value use cases. I mean that's we're, we're normally talking weeks for something like that. And for, you know, to put it in the context of PEGA, we talked a little bit about the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and the fact that they are getting this right. I mean, the fact of the matter is this is the one of the largest banks in Australia, and they are serving these next best conversations through 18 channels. So needless to say, they didn't get it up and running on 18 channels in, in 90 days. Um, but... What they did do is they did this incremental bite size approach that David mentioned, and what and, and the approach to that was let's pick the channel initially that will give us the biggest bang for the buck. So the micro journey that they picked to begin with was you know a agent assisted uh, you know c cross sell. Uh, business purpose and that's the what we advocate to to clients look at you know sort of what is going to give you the biggest bang for the buck and and pick a channel pick a um a business outcome you're looking for and then add again add channels add you know business outcomes and and go through that journey and that could take a couple of years to get through all the channels all right okay all right um, what are the benefits of using H2O.AI platform as compared to alternatives such as SAS or SPSS, et cetera? So, um, I mean, that, that's that's a longer question, right? But but in the, in the end, right, we we are sort of the leader in AI and, and auto ML, and and that the, the fact is is that we build models more quickly. And faster, and there's no, there's no really, really, you know, better models faster is what we, a lot of times what we say, and so we're using the mo the most um, modern techniques in AI and ML, and, and and we really can scale to meet any needs really to that level. And since we are sort of a, you know, a a, a cloud first company, that we can do it re really in, in anywhere you need to have it done, right? In any cloud or even on on premise. So. That's sort of the short answer to that. 
Um, you know, that's, but, you know, in the end, we are um, constantly, you know, improving ourselves, right, as far as any algorithms and scalability and use cases. So that's, that's sort of a focus on ours. And, and also democratizing AI through, through your organization. So we're very passionate about making sure that you not only build models, but you get them in production and you see business value. That's the short answer. <laughs> Great. And will this solution really scale? That's a great question, and the short answer is yes, and for this reason, right? I mean, we, we can talk about all the other stuff, but it's what Vince said before, is that if, if, you're, if they're, you're using Pega, and they've, you've already shown in a lot of their use cases, right, they're doing thousands or tens of thousands of interactions a second, right? So that's, that's scaling huge. Now, if you think about that and you have to call some other external platform to get scores on each one of those interactions, that's going to be ridiculous latency. If you just think about, oh, I need to invoke oh, a model for each product that somebody has, or, 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 right? Just start thinking about in, all, in each of those interactions how many times you might have to call this external system. And even if it's only once, that's still latency that you have to go out and get. And so because you're taking our artifact, the Mojo, and it's being executed and inter interpreted and, and run within their platform, within the PEGA platform, there isn't really a dependency on, on another system. It's really, if you're scaling at thousands or tens of thousands interactions a second, you know, every, every 10 milliseconds counts, right, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but, we're, but our mojos are going to be within their platform, so there really isn't any, you know, latency to some other system, right? It's, it's be, it's, it is the runtime is, is PEGA for the mojo. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I have someone asking the comparison between H2O and Pega versus Firebase prediction. Why use one or the other? Maybe we can use that as a follow-up. I, I don't. I don't know. If I, I. I don't have the answer to that. Apparently, Not a Vince problem. Does. Okay. Apparently, Vince doesn't either. No. So. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't, I don't know what a Firebase prediction is, so. Um. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you, David and Vince, for taking the time today and doing a great presentation. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who joined us today. The presentation slides and recording will be made available on our Bright Talk channel. So thank you, everyone, again, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.